working. Okay, here we go. All right, well, good evening, task force. Uh, tonight is December 1st. Uh, it's pretty neat to wake up in Victoria, Texas on December 1st and see frost on the, the roofs in, in my neighborhood. It actually felt like December 1st today, so that was pretty exciting. I hope you enjoyed that as well. Uh, definitely uh, excited to be getting back uh, to resume the work. It uh, was a wonderful week last week to have a little time to step away and, and give thanks for all that we have in our life and in our world. Um, I did miss you guys, believe it or not, and uh, I missed the momentum that we were building. So I'm definitely excited for us to continue that work with our meeting tonight. I want to definitely start uh, again by saying thank you to each and every one of you who are a part of this work. Um, in that whole spirit of Thanksgiving, um, it definitely has hit on me today uh, as uh, some of our team has been preparing uh, some of the information to bring forward and share tonight. Uh, the tremendous commitment uh, across everyone involved in this process. And, and for some of that, for some of us, that's a part of the work that we do. And while it's a commitment, it's, it's also a part of our charge in our life and in our profession. Uh, and we take it seriously and, and, and appreciate the opportunity to serve and make a difference in this way. Um, but I'm especially thankful for each of our parents and community members who are giving of your time to help us work together and build ownership around a plan to address the school district's needs. Went a little fast there, let me go back. Today's agenda, uh, topics that we will cover today include a brief recap of the information we covered two weeks ago in our November 17th meeting. We'll provide some follow-up information from questions that we received either during the meeting uh, on November 17th or between November 17th and our meeting tonight. Uh, some of that follow-up information will include additional tax rate scenarios that we were asked to bring forward for the group. Uh, thought exchange data. We mentioned in our last meeting that we would be running an exchange around the uh, bond planning work. So there's some data for us to share out with you associated with the thought exchange. Uh, and then we're going to take a, a brief campus virtual tour uh, some of you may have had an opportunity to uh, check out some of those, I'll call them slideshows of sorts, for the six campuses that we've had more in-depth discussion about in regard to potential consideration of renovation or rebuild in our past few meetings. And so we're going to embed a little bit of time for us to uh, refresh uh, for those of us who are not extremely familiar with those campuses. Uh, with a little bit of a virtual tour. We're going to spend the bulk of our meeting in uh, a, an exercise tonight, a small group prioritization exercise. And after that exercise, we will um, ask the small groups to come and share out and, and look at how the data that we put together as small groups uh, comes together uh, in terms of looking at prioritization of uh, those campuses that we have talked in detail about uh, potential renovation or possible rebuild. And we'll end our evening tonight with three polling questions that um, will help be a guide for our team as we work to take feedback from the task force and continue to try to formulate and refine scenarios over the courses over the course of the next few weeks. So meeting five recap, uh, for those of you who were able to join us, uh, we reviewed the area school district tax rate comparisons. We provided BISD maintenance m and budget follow-up information that had been asked. Uh, we provided additional tax rate scenarios that were requested by the task force in our last meeting. Uh, we shared cost estimates for major renovation, renovations or replacements of campuses that had been requested to be looked at in more detail by the task force. And then we spent some time in small group discussion uh, around the three questions you see here on the screen. We discussed what campuses, if any, do you believe should be renovated? 
uh, what campuses, if any, do you believe should be rebuilt? Uh, and what additional information do you need to make informed recommendations? And so we're gonna continue to build upon that conversation tonight. Just as a refresher, uh, we did cover those area tax rates. Um, you can see here on this screen of those area school districts here, we're not the highest, we're not the lowest, we're closer to the lower end, um, but really in alignment uh, or slightly below the majority of the districts in our, in our greater surrounding area here in terms of the INS and total tax rate. Also, just as a refresher, there had been some prior conversation around um, commitment to maintaining and, uh, and committing resources to our facilities. Uh, in the small graph that you see on the bottom right hand side, uh, just as a reminder, approximately 80% of all school districts, public school districts uh, funds, their resources, their MO resources go to staff. We're a people heavy business in education. And so that 81% that you see there is very much in alignment with other school districts across the state of Texas, which means that Victoria and other school districts are typically working with a smaller piece of pie to address all other parts of operating a school district. And when we pull that 19% out and we break it down uh, as a pie graph, uh, we see that 29% of that remaining funding is currently used for facility maintenance and operations. And so we had shared that data because we definitely had heard concerns about uh, whether we were investing in working to maintain and address our facilities and wanted to share that data to uh, express that absolutely uh, about 30% of those funds uh, that we have outside of staff salary and benefits go toward facilities maintenance and operation. The task force in a prior meeting had asked to see some projected uh, bond capacity at increased tax rates uh, above our current tax rate. And so we had brought back uh, information specific to the amount of bond capacity that would be generated by an increase of anywhere between one and four cents. And what we found is that for every penny that the INS tax rate would potentially be increased, uh, it would generate about $7.37 .37 million. Uh, of course, we always talk about the fact that that's based on some estimates, right? It's based on some estimates in regard to property value growth, uh, in regard to interest rates, uh, and in regard to property tax collection rates. So those are the best estimates given those assumptions. We also reviewed the potential priority item costs, the repair items that we had discussed as a task force. We'd made some adjustments based on task force uh, input, moving some items that had been initially uh, categorized as moderate priority into high priority. Uh, and so this is again, just review of those amounts that would be associated with our various grade levels across our facilities. So elementary, broken down from secondary, and then broken down from some of our support facilities that were a part of the assessment. And, and we found that in totality uh, to address all of the high, moderate, and the additional priority was a task force request for costs on playgrounds across all of the elementaries. Uh, so in totality, that amount is $149 million, so a little over $149 million uh, for repairs. We also shared data with the task force last week uh, at the task force requests to see what cost estimates uh, would be associated with renovation versus rebuild of six of our 24 campuses, uh, specifically four elementaries uh, that are either a part of the innovation that's happening in terms of our innovative pathways uh, Mission Valley was identified because of its age, at about 83 years old for the core facility. Uh, and then Patty Welder and Stroman also identified as part of the pathways at middle schools and based on age. 
uh, what we found in there and what we had some conversation about um, in the meeting. And then conversation I was able to have from questions that came forward from task force members beyond the meeting. Um, we expressed, you know, some surprise at the uh, cost for a facility, the estimated cost for a facility, and also uh, the, the closeness in cost between uh, projected cost to renovate versus to, to rebuild. Now, based on some of those uh, questions and conversations that came up both during and after the task force meetings, um, I did ask Huckabee Architects to send some data to me um, associated with square footage costs for new builds of elementary and middle schools over the past five years. Uh, 2020 is not complete, so there's 2020 data is not here. But what you'll see on this screen uh, that is part of the driver of those increased costs for estimates for new builds is the fact that square foot costs have increased fairly significantly over the past five years. Uh, and it's interesting to see how in one year it can go down by 4% and another year it can go up by 7% in the Gulf Coast region, which is there in blue. Um, not surprisingly, given the growth in the central Texas area, that uh, area of Texas has experienced a, a higher level of growth over the course of those years. Uh, and then you can see in red, and just below the red line, the growth uh, when you take Texas as a whole. And we know we are not exactly on the Gulf Coast and we're not exactly in central Texas. And so, we might expect potentially to see a blend of those costs. But um, one of the things that I take from this and one of the things we routinely hear is that uh, the cost of building, whether it's building a new home or building a new school, school building, uh, it doesn't tend to go down from year to year. Those costs tend to rise. Uh, interesting enough, one year from 1% and another year 10% with various factors driving those costs. So that's elementary. You see a similar trend line uh, at the middle school level over the course of the last five years. Um, again, that blue line indicating Gulf Coast, the orange line indicating Central Texas, uh, and then the red line indicating all of Texas on average. So those prices per square foot, if you look back in 2015, which doesn't feel like that long ago, you're looking at anywhere from 188 to $199 per square foot. And if you fast forward to 2019, you're looking at 226 to 288 dollars per square foot in that range. So uh, definitely showing signs that um, what we hear is supported by data in terms of the increased price per square footage to, to build or to renovate over time. In our last meeting, we were also asked uh, for some follow-up information um, in regard to additional tax rate scenarios. We were also, uh, what well, we shared out that we wanted to run a thought exchange as a district, and so we're bringing that data back to you, and then we'll also have campus virtual tours. Now, before I jump into the additional tax rate scenarios, I want to make sure that I am completely um, tr uh, transparent and that I have been asked by task force members, multiple task force members, to provide for context for the task force every revenue generation capacity from a one cent all the way up to what is the maximum INS capacity. In no way in sharing this data is this a recommendation from Greg as a task force facilitator that we should do any certain thing. This is purely for informational purposes. We had a few task force members say we'd like to consider how much need has been identified in the district currently and how that compares to our capacity within the INS tax rate as a whole. 
So with that said, I have two pages of charts to share with you, starting at one cent of increase to the INS tax rate and ending at 27 cents. And I'm gonna say for my own sake a second time that I am not here telling you that we should increase the INS tax rate by 27 cents. This is purely for informational purposes. What we find in the data is that at a one cent increase, the bond capacity generated is just shy of $107 million. And the estimated monthly cost for a homeowner of a $100,000 valued home is 83 cents per month. That understandably doubles for the monthly cost for a $200,000 homeowner at $1.67. And so you can follow this chart all the way down and I'll just pick out a few spots along the way so we can look at six cents at a six cent increase to our current INS tax rate, the capacity generated is $143,705,000. That equates to an estimated monthly cost for a homeowner of a $100,000 home to be $5 per month increase for a $200,000 valued homeowner, it would be $10 additional per month in property tax. And then I'll jump out. I'm sorry, go ahead. Is this based off the 20 year? No, this is based off of the 29 year scenario. Okay, thank you. And, and I'll, thank you for asking that question, Michael. Previously, when we provided these scenarios, We've done so with a 20, a 25, and a 29 year amortization schedule. And because of the amount of data that was being requested, I asked specifically these task force members um, whether they wanted to see that at every one of those levels. And um, we determined that we would bring forth the data at this time at that 29 year amortization. Okay, thank you. Um, jumping to double that six cent to 12 cent. Um, at 12 cents, the capacity generated is 100, just short of $188 million. And that equates to an increase for a $100,000 homeowner of about $10 per month. For a $200,000 homeowner, about $20,000, 20, sorry, $20 per month increase. And I'm, I'm picking six and 12 out because they came out around an even increased dollar value at around $5 and then around $10. And for no other reason other than that. As we move to the second page, this is again, just additional information. I think I shared with the group at one point in time that the maximum capacity uh, for a public school district's INS rate to be set at is 50 cents. And so ours is currently at 0.2235. So we ran this scenario up to 27 cents, which at the 27 cent mark would put our INS rate at just shy of $1.50. And so what we, we could look at that and consider that the school district's maximum bonding capacity currently. And so that maximum bonding capacity at 27 additional cents is around 300 million dollars. It's short, uh, just shy of 300 million dollars. And that equates to a monthly increase for a $100,000 homeowner of a little over $22 a month, or for a $200,000 homeowner, about $45 a month increase. And so one of the things that um, in reading some of the responses from um, Thought Exchange and and just other conversations that I've heard. One, one question that we sometimes get is, you know, it's, it's really hard. We're, we're finding as a task force, and we've just entered some of those conversations about trying to prioritize. It's, it's really hard when you see need across different areas to say, okay, we're gonna start here in the short-term plan and 
look here in the mid and long range plan because naturally we want to help uh, address needs wherever we see them immediately. But I think it's important to note, um, you may hear, I've heard it said, well, let's just wait until we can address all of the campuses that have need at one time. We can rebuild all of the older campuses at the same time. And I think when we look at the capacity that's generated by that 27 cent, we see that um, even among the six campuses that we talked about, when you look at the estimated value or cost to rebuild those campuses, and you also consider other repair needs across the district, that you're, you're already coming up short in terms of resource needs uh, if you're trying to address everything at one time. It's, 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 we don't have the capacity to address everything at one time that might be considered a need. Uh, and that's why it underscores the importance of long range planning, which is certainly one of the charges of, of our task force. I'm just gonna pause for a second because I did, um, we did put this information together uh, based on a request from task force members. Any, any questions before I move forward on this information? The community thought exchange has taken place over the past few weeks. Uh, the thought exchange opened on November 10th and closed on November 29th, which was this past Sunday. So we have some data to share with the task force around that thought exchange. In terms of the breakdown of participants, we had 231 participants who took part in the thought exchange. Of those 231, 124 shared unique thoughts and those thoughts were rated by 2,745 2, times. Uh, when we look at a breakdown of the participants, of those 231 participants in this thought exchange, 34% identified themselves on the initial question as a community member. 35% identified themselves as a parent of a student in the VISD. 27% identified themselves as a staff member in the VISD, and then 4% identified themselves as another category. Uh, so pretty interesting there that it's pretty close to a third, third, third of the, of the participants. I, I will tell you that we had hoped to have a higher participation rate. Um, while we had it open for several weeks and while we used every media venue that we knew to use to get the word out about and encourage participation in the thought exchange. Uh, I think potentially we ran up into a uh, time when it was a busy news cycle and also when we had people celebrating the holidays and perhaps those things may have worked against us in terms of getting larger participation. With that said, I do still think that we have some information that uh, allows us to um, be more informed and to draw upon some of this information for the task force consideration in our work moving forward. Part of the thought exchange included two questions. The first question was, what is your response to this statement? I would support a zero cent tax increase for VISD to conduct high priority repairs of our buildings. So in answering that question, 51% of respondents strongly agreed, 28% agreed, 13% were neutral, and then 5% disagreed and 3% strongly disagreed. So in terms of support for a zero cent tax increase to conduct high priority repairs, you had in totality 79% who agreed or strongly agreed to that statement. When we look at the second statement, I would support a small tax increase to address additional priorities identified by the task force, including major renovation and or replacement of some of the district's older facilities. 
Here we saw 28% of respondents strongly agree, 26% agree. The percentage that were neutral increased to 24%, and you saw a higher level of disagreement than you did at the zero cent tax increase with 11% disagreeing and 11% strongly disagreeing. Uh, so when you look at that question of small tax increase to address additional priorities, you're looking at 54% that agree or strongly uh, agree with that approach at this time based on these participants. One of the aspects of thought exchange is also that not only can you answer these types of survey questions, but you can also provide unique feedback each participant. And so this question was posed to the participants, what are your thoughts and feelings about a potential bond that would include renovation or replacement of some campuses currently being discussed by the task force due to building age and deficiencies in meeting educational needs. The highest rated common thoughts, so thought exchange utilizes an algorithm and it looks at which thoughts um, were highest rated by people who were on what I would call both sides of the issue, those who may have been more supportive of the question and those who may have been less supportive of the question, regardless of how the uh, system read the person's perspective, uh, these were the highest rated common thoughts. Number one, not that these are necessarily in a order, but the first one we have is itemized list. Uh, there was a comment that there should be a very clear and concise itemization of what improvements will be made and where. So that had strong support in terms of those ratings or those stars. Uh, also depends on what it goes for or goes to. Uh, sometimes we put our money towards unnecessary things. We need to be strategic. Certainly that has been a conversation at the forefront for this task force. And then thoughtful plan. The plan to renovate or replace needs to be well thought out and planned. The future should be considered so that another renovation is not needed in five years. And so definitely that has been a part of the thought process that I have heard from our task force as we've been working together through this process. And so it was, it was affirming in a sense to see these come forward as high priorities or highly rated common thoughts and to know that those are also things that have been at the forefront of the task force conversations. Any questions about the thought exchange before we move forward to the campus virtual tours? So within our campus virtual tours, one thing that, that we know is that with a district of our size, oftentimes uh, our, our staff, our parents, our community members are very familiar with a few of our campuses uh, and are less familiar and may never have seen or been to uh, many of our campuses. So when we start talking about some of these campuses that the task force has discussed in the last four, uh, last few weeks uh, regarding consideration for major renovation or rebuild, in the ideal world, we would all gather together as uh, some of us did on this task force uh, over a year ago, and we would haul you around on a yellow bus and show you all of these buildings in person in a large group. Um, but that's not our reality today. And so we have taken some of the photos from the facility assessment that was conducted last year, specific to each of the six facilities that the task force has been discussing regarding potential renovation or rebuild. We've already seen pictures of these facilities in terms of roofing pictures or HVAC pictures, uh, some piping and things of that nature. Uh, these virtual tours are really intended to just give you a, a little more of a feel for those school environments, uh, not so specific to a certain item like an HVAC unit or a roof. So I'm going to take you through 
each of these approximately two minute videos. And they're not in any order of priority. We have the elementary first, and then we have the middle school videos second. Uh, and each one is gonna be between two and three minutes. And we'll just give you a little background information on each campus as we walk through. I'll share just a little bit of information as a reminder about the pathways that these campuses may be involved with. Um, and Mike Vermeeren from Huckabee may share a little bit of uh, feedback that he received from specifically these campus leadership teams uh, about their experience in utilizing the facility as it is today. So we're starting here with Hopkins Elementary. Hopkins was built primarily in 1953 and 54 with some addition in the early 90s. Uh, Hopkins is a part of the blended learning pathway that's going to be starting in our school district next week. Um, so that's uh, one of the campuses that's a part of that innovative programming that's going to be coming. And some information that we got from uh, meeting with the principals was uh, like many, the, the gym is not air conditioned. Uh, hallways are not air conditioned. Uh, the nurse's office is is a bit small and can use uh, and can cause uh, HIPAA issues. Uh, technology on carts is a, a, a tripping hazard that uh, and, and takes up space in the classrooms. Uh, there's no phone based PA system. Uh, the cafeteria, like many uh, campuses, is, is undersized. Uh, parking is, is largely inadequate. And the computer lab arrangement and furniture uh, just doesn't really seem to work well with the, the typical function of a computer lab. Those were some of the highlighted items we had from talking with the principal there. Okay, next we're going to be moving to Mission Valley Elementary. And Mission Valley uh, was the campus that we discussed because of age. Uh, part of the building built in the late 30s with some additions uh, in the 80s and early 90s. And again, comments from the principal. Um, the, the biggest concern, I think, in terms of safety and security and concerns for, for open campus and hallways, you're, you're largely moving from one building to the other throughout the day. Uh, individual AC and heat in the classroom, uh, it's, a, it's a distraction in terms of noise you see there um, for, for teachers and students. Uh, safety and, and visitor control, so not only you know students going in and out uh, of the building, but in terms of controlling people and where they go to when they arrive on campus. Uh, parking and drives, again, uh, inadequate. And the, the building age here creates daily maintenance issues for the staff. I think Mission Valley was among a, a couple of the campuses we talked to where the staff might spend quite a bit of time throughout the day addressing maintenance issues. So a question, Mike, is it okay to ask a question now? Sure, please. So I'm looking at 
at Mission Valley, and the first thing that pops in my mind, and I apologize, I haven't had a chance to visit the campus yet. I've seen pictures. In terms of ADA accessibility, is it, 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 it appears to be very challenged in that regard. Am I misreading that? You are not. And I, I think uh, that it's interesting, actually. I think accessibility um, at, at several of the campuses uh, is an issue. Um, it was not mentioned uh, by and large by principals when we met with them. And I think it's simply because it's, you know, the, the accessibility conditions uh, are things that they just live with every day and, and kind of are used to getting around them. Um, does that make sense? But you are correct. It, it is absolutely a, an issue. And I raised that question primarily because of my own personal experience. I don't think many people know, but back in January, I ruptured both of my quadricep tendons. Mm. And so I'm very challenged as far as getting around. I can walk, but I was looking at Mission Valley and I was saying, wow, I might have some difficulty there getting around. Absolutely. And it's, it's you know, we, we saw rain in the pictures that we were looking at. Um, I, I think it's, it's definitely compounded at the campuses where you have to walk outside to get from one building to the other. Our Thank, you. Next, Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, excellent question, Dr. Lawrence. Our next uh, campus is Shields Elementary. And Shields was built in the early 50s, mid 50s, with some additions in the late 80s and in 1990. Uh, Shields is another of our campuses along with Hopkins that is a part of some of the innovative programming that's gonna be starting next year. Shields will be a part of the blended learning pathway. In comments from the principal here, again, uh, just the general age uh, of the building causes conditions where staff is having to uh, you know, tend to those uh, you know, more than you'd like to see. Um, safety and security concerns, um, not nearly as bad as Mission Valley, but too many access points and uh, as well as the lack of communication and PA systems. So when you have too many access points, you still have that, you still run into that issue of uh, uh, visitor control. Uh, the buildings uh, here are, are spread out. Um, hallways are not insulated and so you have temperature outside affecting the temperature inside the hallways. Um, that very much goes, uh, it's kind of the same point uh, for the gyms. Um, you know, most of the gyms throughout the elementary schools are all the same metal building. And when the HVAC is, uh, the AC is not working, you have a, a hot and humid condition inside. Um, again, a, a small cafeteria. And uh, this was one where the stage, the principal mentioned the stage being uh, non uh, except or not accessible, non ADA compliant. And and Dana, I know you're with us. Um, when these slideshows per campus were were created, they were they were done to try to give a you know a broad spectrum of of pictures of the campus, but recognizing, uh, trying to recognize time through that process too. So Dana, if there's anything in relation to a particular campus uh, that you wanna share regarding child nutrition, cafeteria, uh, kitchen. Well, and particularly with Shields, thank you, Greg. And particularly with Shields um, in the kitchen, it's actually two separate foundations and the foundations are separating. And so to remedy this, uh, we've had to put a metal plate over the two separating foundations. And that the, the crack, if you will, if you want to call it that, is, uh, goes into the walk-in cooler. I know in the past years, and if Johnny is with us, he can attest to this as well, uh, the pipes that are underneath the building, and they're underneath the cafeteria building, they are the old like ceramic or concrete pipes. They're not what we use now for sewer. And so they break, and you frequently smell sewer. Um, especially in the kitchen, but also throughout the school. Thank you, Dana. And, and as we go through with other campuses, um, please feel free to, to add any information that you think would be of value for the group. Thank you. 
Uh, next, we have Smith Elementary. Uh, this is the fourth and final elementary slideshow that we're going to look at here today. Smith uh, was built in the late 50s and early 60s primarily with some additions in the late 80s and early 90s. Smith is a part of the innovative programming that's going to be starting at um, some of our elementaries next year. Uh, specifically, a STEM Academy is going to start at Smith Elementary next school year. And comments from the principal at Smith. Uh, once again, multiple buildings posing a, a safety and security issue. Uh, there are, are generally internet connectivity issues throughout the campus. Uh, a lack of cafeteria space um, impacts the, the seating and the dining times. Uh, so you have that wide range of you know, when lunch starts and when lunch ends. Uh, old framing of doors uh, in the office suites and, and the buildings allows for easy break-ins so that it's hard to secure the doors. Uh, it has intercom issues, so no speakers in the hallways or, or in non-classroom spaces. So classrooms are the only uh, rooms that have the speakers. And I seem to remember also having a conversation about the serving lines here as well. Just the, the general size being too small. I know Smith um, struggles with what we've talked about several of our elementary struggling with in terms of their core spaces being built uh, many decades ago, uh, and then additional uh, wings, adding additional student population um, coming on board over the course of the following decades. And then those core spaces, specifically the, the cafeteria and the kitchen struggling to, to serve the number of students uh, in an effective schedule uh, because those spaces weren't considered for increase at the time that the enrollment was increased. We have two middle schools that we're going to show you that were discussed previously in regard to potential renovation or rebuild. So first we're gonna have Patty Welder Middle School. And Patty Welder was built in the early 60s, mid 60s with additions uh, in the early to mid 80s. Patty Welder is another campus that's a part of the blended learning pathway that will be starting next year. So Patty Welder is a part of the feeder pattern from Hopkins and Shields. And so students in that blended learning pathway would then move forward uh, to the blended learning pathway at Patty Welder Middle School. In comments. And Mike, I want to add here, here we're in a unique situation where we actually have uh, Natalie Albermite, our principal of Patty Welder. So Natalie, I would invite you also to share any insight that you would want to with the task force. Yeah, please go ahead. You can go first and then I'll follow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm curious what was on the list to right, start right. with. <laughs> Did I, right. uh, so, uh, uh, the list I have includes uh, connectivity issues, uh, and I think those those internet uh, connectivity issues, uh, inadequate space for the gym, uh, and the condition of the roof of the gym uh, be, being poor, um, not enough special ed rooms. Um, you, you have a, a decent population of sped students that, that need more space. Um, HVAC issues are a constant issue. Um, general building efficiency issues, uh, and then the building age and general conditions uh, just hindering the student experience. Uh, and you noted that the, the last renovations were in 1985. How'd I do? You did well. I would just echo the HVAC, and that's a daily, every every single day. That is an issue that we deal with, as well as uh, leaking issues with roofs and windows is very, very frequent as well. But 
If you were to ask the teachers and the students, they would say HVAC. Okay. I, I have a safety concern for the students. The cafeteria is located in the very back building of the campus, trying to get trucks in and out of there on the Caliche Road we are crossing the path of where students exit the building and go to the athletic fields and they're on campus and they don't always watch. So it just, it makes me very, very nervous having big, really big delivery trucks going back there to deliver the food products. There are also accessibility issues as well as with some of the stairs and handrails. And I know that's an issue at other campuses also. There's a lot, it's because of um, its original build and the ADA rules, it's very difficult to, for, to comply with the ADA uh, regulations now with, I'm speaking specifically with the cafeteria and, and that kind of thing. It's, it's quite crowded. The uh, last and sixth campus that we have to share with you is Stroman Middle School. And you may recall Stroman has served in various capacities over the years. It was built in the primarily in the late 60s, uh, was a high school for a number of years before transitioning to a middle school. And Stroman is a part of our STEM pathway. So that innovative programming will begin at Stroman in the coming year. And comments uh, on that campus. Um, first one is uh, multiple spread out buildings creates operational and safety issues. Uh, so you cannot cluster groups for each grade level. Um, circulation is tough and there's long travel distances for students to get from various parts like fine arts and uh, gyms, uh, some athletic spaces. Uh, and as they're doing that, traveling those long distances, currently they're also crossing a, a road, uh, a small road that's actually uh, used throughout the day uh, by, by district staff. Um, there's a opportunity, opportunities to, uh, I, you know, students to either get lost or, or just hard to uh, you know, keep a visual eye on students as well. Um, and the, the buildings being spread out, um, it was noted, you know, really kind of hind hinders the, the campus culture. There's a lack of plumbing in some of the science rooms. Uh, interior classrooms lack windows. Uh, so in the four-story building, uh, in, in many of the classrooms are interior without windows. There's inadequate power and data drops throughout. Uh, flooding uh, in the second floor uh, due to a loss of mortar through the walls. Um, that happens. Uh, hallways uh, are wet and water in classrooms from, from students uh, going in and out. Uh, is a concern. So that's what the exterior hallways. Uh, technology is limited in the rooms. There are HVAC issues um, and condensation from the air conditioner leaks uh, from the ceiling tiles. Gates around the campus are, uh, are, are not secure. And the number of restrooms uh, is, is inadequate. Uh, and, and many just because of the old condition, uh, they can't lock those. Um, li the library acoustics was also mentioned. Uh, tough to function as a, as a library. And there's the picture of some of the gates. And I'm not sure Miss Hearn has joined us for been able to join us for some of our meetings. I'm not sure if she's with us, but Jessica, if you are, I just want to invite you to share any additional information you might want to. As well as Dana regarding the cafeteria. The kitchen in the in this particular school, the floor is unlevel. Uh, the, the drains in the floor sit about half an inch lower than the actual concrete. And there's a, a gentle slope that goes uh, to those drains. That's probably, this kitchen is probably the one that causes the most workman comp issues because the, you load a cart up with product and it rolls across the floor and rolls into someone or over someone if they've loaded it too much. Uh, we've lost a lot of product because it tips over. Uh, 
we've done new walk-ins. We've we finally took out the old walk-in, which was original to the building in 1962, or seven, or whichever day that was, and that provided us some more space. But it's 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 haphazard, and um, and, and it's not safe for a functioning kitchen. So I'll speak for. Um, um, Jessica Hearn in her absence about the air conditioning is pretty much the same way as Natalie's over Patty Welder. One day it could be room 102, the next day it's room 103 right across the hall that the air handlers leaking in the classroom, leaking in the classroom. You know, they're, you'll see trash cans uh, catching the water until our guys can get there. And um, we're pretty spread thin, but pretty much the same thing with air conditioning. There's some chillers there that, that uh, I think there was a meeting at one point in the cafeteria and it was an actual task force meeting a couple of a year ago, maybe, on um, the instructional side of it, and the pipe just bust, and they just started had to catch water in fifty-five gallon drums in the cafeteria kitchen, the, the cafeteria uh, sitting area. So, Johnny, um, aren't there plugs in the floor that are not grounded in that kitchen as well, and the basic uh, electrical is not enough to handle any more equipment? Right. Uh, any any new upgrades, the, the system would have to be totally upgraded. We would have to come in with new um, power for whatever other systems would be upgraded at the existing building there. And that's where the electrical was probably like our built our homes back in the day that, that did not have that grounded outlet built in the 60s. So take that into consideration as well, but we've added ground rods around. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all for sharing that additional information. It, it's it's very helpful. Um, part of our uh, thinking in wanting to make an effort to share a, a virtual tour is in regard to this next step in our in our meeting tonight. Um, we've looked at these uh, six specific facilities based on task force input, uh, focusing on those campuses that. Um, have a higher level of identified priority uh, need, uh, age, and or also uh, new and innovative pathways. And so one of the, our language is really important. And the, the language that we use in our district is that um, there are some things where there may not be one obvious right answer or one even right answer. Uh, those are questions that are what we consider to be complex and we also say that you can measure the complexity of an issue by the level of disagreement uh, around what that right answer might be. And so uh, we are gonna enter into this prioritization exercise and it's, it's one of those where you're sort of walking into the unknown. Sometimes we walk into processes and feel like, hey, I kind of know how this one's gonna come out. And that's not the case here because it's a complex issue. Um, but, um, we are going to do the, the hard work and have the challenging conversations. That's, that's what our, our role is and that's what our charge is uh, in coming up with potential recommendations and in strategic planning for facility needs. Um, we have Megan Smith from Huckabee who is going to be uh, walking our small groups through a prioritization exercise. And so at this time, I am going to ask Megan to take over. Perfect, thank you, Greg. And good, e good evening, everybody. Uh, appreciate that setup. I do think we have some uh, difficult and challenging conversations ahead of us. Before I introduce the prioritization exercise we're gonna complete tonight, we thought it would be helpful to reshare this graphic from meeting two. Uh, we, we've talked a lot about, we know our charge as a task force is to provide short, mid, and long-term recommendations. And if you remember, what this graphic depicts is that we have to start with the vision and work backwards. And it would be short-sighted for us as a task force to make decisions just about the short term without knowing what the ultimate goal is and, and possible intermediate steps we, we may take to, to get us there. So tonight when we are you're making decisions in this activity, I really want you to think about this and think about those decisions in the context of this of your long range goal and not be focused yet on needing to decide what is in that short step because um, 
we'll get there eventually. If you'll go to the next slide, Greg. So again, for the purposes of tonight's exercise, we're gonna focus on the six campuses that we have identified uh, for a potential new build. You have those repeated here in front of you with the corresponding estimate for building those new campuses. Um, all, those have not changed from last meeting and hopefully those slideshows were um, helpful for this exercise we're about to, to do. Um, but if we felt if we could get these six campuses in a rank order of highest to lowest, again, not focused necessarily on this bond yet and trying to make short term decisions yet, it will provide us a foundation to work from to then begin to make those types of decisions. So if you go to the next slide, we're, we're actually going to prioritize these six campuses four different ways. So these four categories or criteria we identified to help you as a task force to have structured conversations around these topics as well as to provide kind of a framework on how you may differentiate these campuses. Um, they've already risen to the, the top of the priority list. Um, so how do we decipher what um, might be a higher priority of a, than another. So the first way we're gonna look at it is based on what we're calling urgency of need. We want you to consider the existing structure and, and facility and how dire is that replacement needed due to its age and existing condition. And if any of those are a safety and security or even learning environment concern. The second would be community served. So another way we may differentiate these six campuses is the student population they serve. Um, as a task force, you may feel it is important to invest first in a particular grade level um, or even pathway, or even um, you know, the surrounding community that it serves. I was still on the last slide, Greg. <laughs> hey, I'm so sorry, Megan. I'm trying to set up small groups while you're doing this, um, but I'm going to get you back to where you were. No problem. Is that the right spot? <laughs> okay, next time. Yep, perfect. The third is value. So there's a, a cost associated, of, certainly, with these rebuilds. And again, considering the age and condition of these existing structure, the money spent to rebuild them, um, there's a return on investment there and a projected life cycle of a new build um, compared to the existing structure your, your, um, your students are in today. The fourth is community support. So if ultimately these campus rebuilds are going to the community to request approval in the form of a bond, we thought it would be valuable to look at these six campuses in terms of what the likelihood of community support would be for the investment required for that campus. So those are the four ways we're gonna prioritize these six campuses. So in a moment, we're gonna break into small groups and each um, group will have a facilitator that's gonna pull up a spreadsheet where we can actually input live the rankings that you as a small group decide on. So as you can see, you're gonna rank order the six um, based on urgency of need. So you're gonna assign a, a one, two, three, four, five, and six um, for each of these categories. One being highest, your, your highest priority, six being your lowest. The average ranking will populate there in the last column and it'll give us an opportunity to come back together and look at that data um, and you can re will report out as a small group the um, a reflection on your conversation and and the results of your activity here. Um, so when we average, you know, we could have two campuses that that even tie. The, I would just want to encourage you know encourage you as you're doing this to just think about the criteria that's set forth and. This is no way a final vote, but again, an exercise to provide a structure for us to start making those short, mid, and long range decisions. This is the point where I emphasize that this is a process. And you may be feeling pressure right now of, oh, I've got to rank order something, and this is, they're all important. 
Um, and, and so I just want to reiterate for all of us that uh, I told uh, some of our team today that I was going to make a comparison to Greg in English class as a middle school and high school student and how we all probably went through that rough draft process phase and you'd get some feedback and maybe some red ink and adjust this and adjust that until you ultimately came up with a really rock solid paper. And in, in our case, we're hoping to come up with a rock solid plan, but this is the drafting process right here. So please put any anxiety aside and we look forward to the conversation. Megan, are you ready for me to send them into small groups? Yes, um, everybody that's a facilitator should have, if you don't yet, you should have the um, sheet up and you will share with your small group. So, yep, I'm ready. And we've allocated, we're, we're gonna, if we need 30 minutes, um, we're hoping we might be there at that point to come back to share out. Uh, we definitely don't wanna rush what is an important conversation here, um, but we're targeting that to help you sort of manage your time as a small group. Still not letting me, Greg. <laughs> no, you're on mute. Please trust Megan right now. Somebody else take notes on the side and <laughs> I'll go back to the drawing board and see if I can figure this out. Apologize for the technical difficulty. Now you're left with Hopkins, Shields, and Smith. Leandra, you're probably partial to Hopkins, but if there's anything you can share with us about I Hopkins, would be, maybe beneficial. But I do know that Smith bringing up the STEM program will serve a larger purpose um, with them bringing in the STEM. I mean, we're going to be blended learning and we're going to partner up with Patty Walder and the same thing goes for Shields. But um, Smith is going to be a STEM campus and so I think it's important that if we're going to commit to being a STEM campus that we give them that opportunity to excel. So in terms of learning conditions, uh, I, I, I sent you a text here. It, when, I, when I try to share my screen, does that make sense? Yes, uh, um, I joined um, the group that Megan is facilitating first, and I went into the settings to try to enable screen sharing for participants, and um, I have some work to do on my Zoom knowledge still, apparently. So if anybody wants to take notes to make sure Mike's recording correctly, please keep an eye on him. <laughs> you got him, Adam? I think we're right. do this just fine, so. Okay, so. to go to the back cafeteria area, you know, which could be, you know, that canopy at Stroman could be redone and make a huge cafeteria to, to, to serve the population. So it, it, it's hard to, to decipher which one we would pick as a uh, rebuild for Stroman or Patty Walter for me. How about y'all? Well, that's my problem. I'm having a, I'm just picking them because of uh, there being more kids. Absolutely. I thought from community support, I, I would think it'd be one too, just from that aspect of community support, but that's not necessarily true based on kids. Right. It'd be parents. You know, where are yep. the strongest parents? Right. I'm not able to share my screen. I apologize, guys. Uh, apparently, there's some permission that I'm not able or I do not know how to enable right now during the course of the meeting. So, Francis isn't able to share her screen. Um, if, if you want to have a secondary person to keep an eye on Francis, well, she's used to auditors. So uh, <laughs> feel free to write down those numbers along with her. But Francis, if you can input them on behalf of the group, um, 
I'm uh -huh. sorry that she's not able to share her screen. Well, that's all right with me. I trust you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Based on, uh, you know, again, if y'all bouncing around, uh, the community support. That, that makes sense. And that's my only confusion. You're only giving us one option. It's all rebuild or nothing. Well, I think um, with this, with this um, exercise, it's not so much rebuild or renovate or high priority, but just looking at the bigger picture, we know what Hopkins needs. Is that, are their needs, in our opinion, more important than Mission Valley's urgency of needs? Is the community served at Mission Valley, are we gonna rank them at a higher priority based on the buildings and the conditions? Is that, are we ranking them higher than Hopkins? Community support, this will go where Dell, um, Dell's concerns are. Is the community support, do we feel it's going to be high, a level one, or do we feel that it's going to be a six? Excuse me, this is Pastor Greer, can you hear me? Yes, sir. I, from, from listening to what you just said, um, we, we, we know that um, the public is, is not on board with this um, from what you just said. And when you're looking at the priority, just like he says, if you go from 100 to $300 million, you just create another problem, although it is necessary. But when we look at these schools, I haven't heard anyone say anything about, are these schools so far apart that they can't be consolidated stuff? I don't think that that's an option. That no, that's not, not an option. That's, that's not, not an not option. Me, that's not for me to answer if it is or is not an option. Dr. Lawrence, you may I can speak. I can speak. I really can speak to some of that. So if you recall, and again, um, the, the, a point that Dale raised a, a while back that I think is pretty solid, that when you look at Mission Valley, you look at, it, at the achievement levels there, they're significant enough where, where the school appears to be doing well. But when you take into account some of these facility challenges that are there, you have another story. But in the to speak to the whole issue of expansion, if you recall, if these campuses were reconstructed, we'd be expanding the student population significantly. And the reason that would be happening is so that you would have really fewer campuses and we'd have a lot more efficiency in a plan where we have larger schools accommodating more kids, requiring overall fewer facilities. And so I think that's a part of what's kind of built into the, uh, the construction of any new facilities. But I do get the point that folks are raising about where the community is. Absolutely, I think the, the points are well made. And I hope I'm getting to what you were, the question that was raised about, um, expanding the size of the facilities. That's a part of the reconstruction redesign plan is to accommodate many more students and the overall effect would be the need for fewer facilities overall in the district. And that, that was what I was, I, was, I was speaking about because I, I, when I look at, at uh, Mission Valley, I noticed it only has 297 uh, kids. So, if you look at a couple of the other schools, they have room in those schools for, for those 300 kids. So I was just wondering, had, had any, you know, thought about looking at the number that's, that's actually in the school and the capacity of the school and the possibility of moving them. It, it, uh, but, you know, I don't know exactly where all of the elementary schools are. So that, that was why I asked the question. It's, it's a great question, Pastor, and um, you guys are talking about a, a very important conversation here. Uh, and so some of the things that I think it would be important for uh, this group and our community as a whole to, to be knowledgeable of, mindful of, thoughtful about 
Uh, one is that there's been a concerted effort over the last three years to operate as efficiently as possible. And as a part of that effort, we've merged four campuses, three of them being elementary campuses, smaller elementary campuses. We've also rezoned uh, our district in terms of what zone students live in in the city and what campus that means they attend and have zoned them in a way that we have 90 or higher percentage of available seats zoned. So there's not an elementary out there operating currently that has all of this extra, a whole lot of extra space to absorb. Uh, the other thing to be mindful of in a district of our size is the geographic range over 600 square miles. And particularly if you were talking about um, a campus like Mission Valley, which is in the far northwest of our district, uh, where that district line <coughs> extends to is a significant distance from any of our other campuses. Uh, so there would be some, some uh, significant challenges to simply saying you take a campus like that and spread it out uh, among the other campuses. One being the fact that we're already using a large percentage of our available space at the elementary and two being the logistics of not wanting students on school buses um, 60 to 90 minutes a day both ways, especially young students of that age. Thank you, that helps. Absolutely, excellent questions. I, I, another input over the years, I know neighborhood schools, parents are loyal to those na neighborhood schools in the conversation. But once you leave in that conversation to a more global conversation we're having, they, their voices get minimized by other parents feeling about their elementary district. And so as you try to drive a conversation, the value of Mission Valley, the importance of what they do as far as within that, but within the district and the other voters, they don't see that. So if, when you're talking a community input and value, how you message across the board where the small percentage of the elementary parents in Mission Valley compared to Patty Welder Middle School is entirely different language, if that makes sense. If you look at Mission Valley geographically, if you try to move those kids too far, I think Myersville would love to have the additional enrollment. And so that's something to be very careful about. We don't want to force the district to go small. And if you look at Myersville scores, they typically do very well. So uh, that may be something that we need to consider too. We don't want to run any uh, children off, but if we have to take these kids too far, that could potentially be a problem. Uh, just, that's my thoughts. And I'll shut up for a little while. And I don't mean to push you guys, you're having an excellent conversation. I see Ashley, you were able to share yes. your screen. Um, yes. Just want to encourage you guys to work through this challenging process together. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Could we, could we work through it in such a way that we're not committing to build, but rather uh, that's a campus that needs attention? Yes. And you are not right now committing to say that a part of any plan is a rebuild. This is of the campuses we talked about consideration of rebuild. If you were to prioritize, how would you prioritize that group? And Hopkins, all three built in 1953. They're all blended, you know, with the pathways. They're all in the blended pathway. Does anybody know populations on those? I don't. I don't think I. Have. Based on the uh, zoning committee 
I want to say they, they tried to make them all very similar in population. Right. I mean, we could get them, but I'm, I'm sure we're going to, it's, yeah, it's still going to be a, a toss up when it, if we're looking at that as criteria, um, maybe between these three, we shift to something besides student population. Um, what about geography? Uh, I know just kind of in the task force conversations that I've had that the, uh, the south side of town feels underrepresented, which in that case would give Hopkins the, uh, maybe the next priority. I'm okay with that. Okay. Uh, Cause I wouldn't know how to rank those next three anyway. So I, I like that. Uh, I'd say if we're going by geography and I'm just kind of just factually speaking, geography south to north is going to be Hopkins, Shields, Smith. But I don't have I don't have a map right in front of me, but um, I'd say I'm pretty close. Sounds accurate. So those all three are on the pathway. Those all three have about the same populations. So we're trying to figure out how else to rank them for this category. So that makes sense to me. I'm good with that. So, Justin, did you go to Stroman? Yeah, well, I, I did go to Stroman. It was Memorial though. Oh, that's right. That was the freshman <laughs> campus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. You were just a puppy. We drive back and forth on a bus. That's how <laughs> wide our campus was. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think the reality of this this conversation, and uh, when since Dr. Bonewell checked in, I'm gonna let you know you made us echo. So I don't know what you did when you checked in, <laughs> but um, because we understand and we can see what the problem may be, I believe that is something that we promote, uh, where it's to the, the, the to the board or whatever. Why it's a need to make sure that promotion and awareness is going out into uh, the lesser uh, communities um, uh, for, for that, that support. Um, because like I say, we know the history. We, 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 we know why things are, are the way they are, even when they're not, not spoken. Um, and so I believe to fix it, we just gotta understand it and come with a, with a change of better uh, a, a approach uh, uh, to things because um, yeah, you know, we know, we know, they know, we know, like, I know parents that take their kids to Mission Valley that, you know, are not, I wouldn't say really close to, you know, um, and things, and where it was on the contents of they thought they were going to get better learning, or small, some of the biggest things was the smaller classrooms, where they had uh, fewer students in the classroom, um, and that's some of the things that, that, that I heard, uh, and things, but, um, uh, I don't know. It, it, it's a uh... get us five more years or so before we have to do another, you know, major um, project. But um... yes, which one has the highest per? You know, which ones have the higher percentage? Um... So if I were to go just to look at it versus uh, or based on percentage of the replacement value. I thought the, the three grade schools and the two middle schools were all pretty much, it's like a toss up whether replacement versus renovation, if you do the full pathway enhancement, you know what I'm saying? I think they were pretty close. I think we'll be talking small percentages if we do that. But if we look at like the pacify you know the five and seven million dollar renovations at the schools compared to the full pathway renovation might be the better one to look at in this category you know versus replacement are we spending eight million dollars to fix and 40 million dollars to replace are we spending four you know what i'm saying that i just i maybe I, in my mind i think that might be the better way to look at it because they were all pretty much near if we do the pathway adjustments it's pretty much replacement on almost all of them so you're saying maybe use the, if we were to do a major renovation of each of the campuses, use use that for your replacement value? Yeah, yeah, use that, but not the replacement for the 
stem, like the stem or pathway we want to do. Just right? Because we had two different types. Yeah, like the twenty-four million dollar repla replacement at the at the middle schools instead of the seventy million dollar renovation to get it to the pathway level. Right. Okay. Does that make sense to everyone? That everybody, I know I can sometimes talk right. convoluted. Because we, we already know if we do the full path. Those middle numbers. Re redefine community served. How much the community will support? Or I'm, well, I'm just community remember. served is we're looking at the, the population. Student population. Yeah. Student population. Absolutely. That's what I thought. Okay, so. Um, so. Uh, according to the paperwork, I think Smith Elementary and uh, has the least amount once, once you take Mission Valley out. I think that uh, it shows Smith as having the least amount of people attending the school, but it's the same size as the, as the other school. Mm -hmm. I could support that. Absolutely. Okay, Smith again, number six. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. value ROI, number one, which, uh, which campus in any capacity of renovations, fixes, all of that, which, which campuses do we see as our number one of value and return on investment? I go Stroman. Okay. I'd agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like I Stroman there. That's number one. Yes, I feel it too. Number two. Hopkins. And I'm. Um, we remodel. What's our return on our investment? I, I don't know. Greg, what's the our, uh, return on investment? What were we thinking about there? Well, I can tell you the exact term that was, or the exact rationale that was used in the, um, well, it was related to what you're spending and the life cycle of, of that facility in um, a renovation versus a, a rebuild. Um, I think what also may be something that the task force might consider is what would the costs of the high and moderate priority repair items be compared to uh, the major renovation or rebuild cost. Uh, when we looked at that information fairly early on, you know, you had some campuses where that was what I would call a lower percentage, maybe in the 20% area versus some others where it was double well more than that just to do repair items. Um, so I think that, that was sort of the thought process was what, what are you getting in terms of educational facility and lifespan of facility based on the type of work. Yeah, that's kind of doesn't really fit in with these other questions with these other columns. No, it's not intended to. I mean, they're, they're, these are all various considerations um, to think about as you prioritize what to address. Okay. If you believe that they all have the same return on investment, then, then perhaps that would be a challenge. Um, if there's one, there's one that comes to mind for me and not trying to play the water, so I'm not gonna list any names, but there's a campus that just addressing the repairs was a very high cost and a high percentage of the rebuild compared to some of the other campuses on the list. So in the way that I think about return on investment, that makes sense to value that one or rate that one at a higher level for return on investment. It's hard to remember those numbers though. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have them in front of us. <laughs> that might make it a lot easier. <laughs> well, again, this is a rough draft. You're not, this, we're not making final decisions tonight of any sort. You may decide as a task force that we're not, or the task force is not recommending any rebuilds. Um, but if we potentially may have a recommendation like that, we, we want to start the conversation about what do you know, what do you still need to know to prioritize that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if I'm remembering correctly, I feel like Hopkins might have been in the best shape. I How think Mission, yeah, I think for that, I think Mission Valley would be the best, One. you know. 
yeah, best yeah it would be number like, one because you want to rebuild it. it. You don't want, you would want to rebuild it. And then I feel like Strom and Patty would be in two and three. I'm sorry, which one was number one? Mission Valley. Mission Valley. Mission Valley. Based, based because it is old and then if you instead of spending money on repairs just replace and it's probably a number one it's the basis there I mean, Welder was. and then two and three was you said stroman patty, Stroman and, uh, and patty welder and i don't know which one and hopkins was six and i don't remember which ones are better in better shape shields or smith john do you have any perspective i would say on? i would say smith is better than shields so Smith so. five and Shields four. Okay. Based on so that logic, to start. Was Patty Wilder number two? I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, had a, that had a high cost, right? Yes. yes. Okay, so I'm going to read these back to y'all, if that's okay. Okay. I'm going to see me. I'm going to one, Mission Valley, two, Shields. Three Stroman, four Smith, five Petty Walden, six Hopkins. That sound correct? Yes. Okay. Community serve. One Petty Walden, two Stroman, three uh, Shields, four Smith, five Hopkins, six Mission Valley. Okay. Value uh, return on investment, Mission Valley, one. Mission Valley than any other campus. If we use that, when I when I think about logic, you're spending a lot more, so you're not getting the value at Mission Valley. So I'd almost put Mission Valley as the last one on this one because you're spending the most per student to fix, you know, to get it up the or replace it. If I follow, it is growing and you know they're they're developing out there, but it's not increasing at a high rate where they're their enrollment's gonna be jumping up anytime soon, so. Again, what is what is their role in the pathway? Because that may determine what their enrollment's gonna be, not so much the development around them. All these pathway schools are gonna be choice. They're not gonna be a pathway school. They're not part. Mission Valley's not? No. It's the only one on the list that's not a part of those pathways. Okay, I missed that. It's just a need school. <laughs> it's yeah. It definitely needs high speed internet. We'll put it that way. <laughs> How are we doing time wise compared with the other folks? Um, I need you to pick up the pace a little bit if you can. You got it. All right. This is, this is good work we're doing. <laughs> yes, I, I know. I don't want to rush good work. We want quality. I want to know cost per student ratio on repairs versus replacement on every building. I'll, uh, we've got it recorded now. <laughs> Keep All it right. moving, Mike. So what, what, what were the uh, numbers that we had there? Did you write that down, Adam? Yeah, yeah I did. Um, we had 52% on Mission Valley, followed by... <laughs> was it Cody? Uh, I mean, okay. considering it was a high school, I mean, there was a lot of very deep uh, old pride associated with it. There is a nostalgia that, that is that is there with that campus. Um, at some point, that's going to have to. <laughs> it yeah, needed so a that, lot. I mean, yeah, so that's what I'm I, like. Are they going to? Would they? If we leveled it and built new, would they be excited, or would they be like, "Why did they level it?" Or you know, like I rather them renovate it. You know, I'm trying to figure out how to pick one or two. Yeah, you're you're. You're spot on. It, a, a full renovation has the possibility of not not going well um, in the community, or a full rebuild, I guess. Um, you know, but I think there's ways to there's ways around that that that, they, that we'd have to figure out, or Edman would have to figure out. So guys, I'm going to challenge y'all, uh, and again with the mindset that this is a draft, I'm going to challenge you to finish in the next five minutes. We got this. Okay. All right. I'm going to start right. your way. Thank you. Uh, based on the criteria that, um, that um, you know, with the square footage part of it, I mean, I'm, I'm inclined to say Patty Welder goes to two because they have more space that could be reused. So, I mean, if. In, in the third, 
in order. But then I realized we were going to do it the way as uh, each category. And then at the end, I thought it was going to rank it one through six for us, you know, overall. Mm -hmm. But now now I'm seeing it. It's kind of, um, like y'all said, I, I, I kind of didn't understand. Yeah, it's, it, really it's, it appears to be averaging it out. It is. Yeah. It, is. Um, it is ranked one through six, basically. Because Stroman would come out as one, and, and Patty Welder would be two. Shields would be three. Uh, Hopkins would be four, Mission Valley would be five, and Smith would be six, according to how it tallies out. And then we'll also get to see how the other groups also rank uh, their prioritization based yeah. on the I'm four sure different you criteria. Did with the job as we did. What's throwing it off is that, uh, which, I, what I'm, which is really, how can I say it? I understand from the VISD standpoint is important, but I guess I look at it from a planning a uh, point where I'm like the community support because the community support is there because I know we need to get a vote for it to pass. You know what I mean? Whatever. But I think that that's what threw it off because we're looking at the rationality of, okay, we know Mission Valley people going to come out strong to, right. you know, um, whether or not. And that's the part that's, that throws it off because even though we know the South side and, and, and those in that community know there's a need for it. The question is in our rationality and correct me if I'm wrong, we know from history that it's unlikely for them to come out and 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 do what it needs to be done for it, though. Still but I, I was also saying we got a bunch of new voters due to the the new presidential election and the different things that have gone on. We have a lot more people that have, you know, that are voting now also that might participate. But Justin, that's why people such as yourself, you know, and like the South Side Coalition and all those things have to keep the enforce have to keep that high. You know what I'm saying? Because it'll die out. You know what I mean? Or whatever. And then everybody go back to the, hey, 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 I love you. Close my door. Uh, go through the, uh, <laughs> my kids are back. <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, go through the, this, 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 I, hey, I love you. Close the door. Daddy, daddy doing something. Uh, okay, close, close the door, though. <laughs> Sorry, went to daddy mode. Um, my whole tone, my whole tone change. I, I sound soft and stuff. Um, but uh yeah, Justin, that's what I was saying. That's where you have to where, where you push in, man, and, and and Jody and everybody, you know, all of us that participate in Southside meetings or things, uh continue to keep that urgency for them to, to, to get out and then then they'll get the support they need. Because I know they will go, they would they would say, Yes, we need a new school and it would help that get bad. They I know they would. If they if they participate. That, that would actually help the school board. Try to pass it, really. Yeah. I'm with it. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Bonewell, we were finished within the five minutes, but way before the five minutes. Uh, you guys have done a tremendous job. I actually have access to all of those spreadsheets that are connected. And so we've got one. Manipulating the system, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it. And so uh, we have one group that's finishing up their last column, and then I'll be bringing everybody back. And what we'll do is we'll go through each individual group and ask um, you to have a representative just share out a little bit about and And then I will show you a master list that is taking an average of each one of these groups uh, to show you sort of the average of the large group. Um, and that'll just be a jumping off point for us. You know, I'll, I'll keep reiterating, this is a process. This is just one of the steps in the process these ratings or rankings, this may or may not have um, merit in what the task force ends up recommending, but it's a, it's a part of the conversation that needs to happen. Well, sir, I nominate uh, uh, Mr. Corey to speak because- uh, did that last time. I've already had my turn. <laughs> hey, I have kids running in, and so I don't, I'm gonna mute myself. <laughs> Blame it on the children. I will, I will easily hand that off to somebody else, please. I didn't accept that vote. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody, nobody's turning it over, sir. <laughs> you guys got 60 seconds to figure it out. Good luck. Oh, man. <laughs> Thank you, Corey. We appreciate oh, it. Leave, leave it in the room now. Uh -huh. Great job, Corey. It's going to be short and sweet, I'll tell you that. <laughs>
And Ashley, I mean, you did a great job in facilitating. <laughs> I don't know if I have enjoyed a uh, bounce around between small group conversations more than I did this one. Um, I can definitely tell you, and I see Corey smiling as a teacher. I know as he goes around to small groups of students, there's certain days when he knows the work is getting done. And there's certain days when he knows, hey, I gotta kind of, I gotta find a way to motivate. And uh, you guys were all motivated and you were having really uh, important conversation. And I wanna thank and congratulate you on that. As a next step in the process for this exercise, I'm gonna be sharing my screen and I have um, access to the document for each group and then what will be considered a master document that averages together uh, the totals from each group and each column and overall. So it'd be interesting to see where we might see some trends or themes potentially. Um, I'm gonna ask a representative from group one to share out first as soon as I pull up their screen. Uh, if we have a representative from group one that can share with us, uh, just a little bit about your, your process or thoughts about going through this. Anyone from group Adam, one? Adam, would you like to go? All right, sure. Um, so our thought process was uh, we kind of dissected each column individually. Uh, and at first, we kind of went off into a tangent. We're talking about the whole kind of ranking, but we went back and thought about the urgency of need as far as safety um, and uh, then community served. We talked about it, it, we talked at length about the um, pathways that are coming up and why the importance of those pathways would be to get served would be there for each of those rankings for us. Uh, return on investment, that was an interesting one. We talked quite, quite a bit about what would be the biggest bang for the buck. Uh, we even off, went off in a tangent and started talking about student populations, basically how much, you know, dollar per, per, for every dollar we spend, how much per student are we spending compared to campuses. We didn't get that far into there, but we, we talked about each individual campus and kind of the comparisons between like Hopkins and Shields, uh, Smith, talking about the pathway needs. And we just really went through a nice little, you know, we didn't just say it's, you know, strumming across the board each time we discussed and strumming wound up being the, the highest need for us um, across the board, but we discussed each individual one as how it relates to the column it is. So those are the numbers we came up with um, as far as what we thought the community could, um, would support. And, you know, I think community supports Stroman well over Patty Welder, even both of them have needs, but Patty Welder presents itself better now for instance. Um, we did talk about a strong support, community support for Mission Valley, as we saw the last time we had a bond as well. So that was our thought process. Um, that's how we came up with the numbers. I'm gonna keep it short and sweet tonight. Excellent work. Thank you for presenting on behalf of group one, Adam. No problem. We're moving to the spreadsheet for group two now. Yeah, I'll go ahead and speak on our behalf. Um, just like Adam mentioned, we just went down to every column, dissected each campus, um, had the conversation. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything else to say. Um, we just, you know, urgency of need, we went by age of building basically, and then community support, which campus would be supported most in the bomb. But um, we had a good conversation. So our numbers are off to the side. And, and again, community support, we know the areas around the communities, around the schools, they support them. But I was more thinking from the, uh, the district wide, how would the community support specific campuses? Kind of came into my mind, so how I was trying to write it as well. And I think that as we were um, putting together this exercise, that's reflective of what our thought process was as well, um, was if, if we, uh, or if the task force were to prioritize a rebuild of one of these campuses or two of these campuses, whatever that might be, um, which campuses do you think would receive voter support? Group three.
I was group three. I guess I told them I didn't want to report out though for them. But I, <laughs> I will start it. Um, so we approached it the same way, talking about each category um, and a lot of really good conversation. Uh, as far as urgency of need, right off the bat, Mission Valley, there was con consensus um, that that was number one. And then building age helped definitely play a factor in looking at what um, the order followed from there. Um, Stroman just and Shields being following because of the, you know, age of those camp or the those safety of those campuses and the exterior buildings. Um, same for community served. I think um, we had a lot of the same comments that you heard. Um, value and return on investment talked about the fact that um, looking at the bang for your buck, Stroman, just the invest, investment that would be required to keep up that existing structure was talked about um, and the amount of work orders and things that come out of that, that building followed by Patty Walder. Um, community support, like everybody else has said, Mission Valley was um, came out number one, to, followed by Stroman because of just community wide would be well received. Thank you very much, Megan, for reporting on behalf of Group Three. And I don't want each group to feel like you have pressure to live up to the last report in terms of length and things like that. I know we're discussing some similar things, so I. I'll ask you to, uh, in the next three groups, add any additional things that you'd want to build on from your conversation that you may have heard from other groups and want to emphasize or to add to the conversation before you heard. So for group four, we um, tackled each uh, category individually in the same manner. A lot of the same discussion was had um, in terms of the community support. Uh, we looked at what uh, would voters support. And so while one campus may be the urgency of need may be higher, the community support in term of, terms of voters and how they would vote may not match that. Um, so that was uh, one thing that we discussed, uh, but it's pretty cut and dry um, in terms of how we ranked everything. Thank you, Ashley and group four. Do we have a rep from group five to share? All right, I'll go. I was, Thank trying, you. I was trying to call not it, but um, <laughs> We we also uh, discussed each column individually. Um, there was an overlying theme uh, kind of exiting the conversation that there was a lot of priority to the junior highs uh, for a variety of reasons from each category. Um, the ROI was a, an interesting uh, conversation that sticks out in my mind because we went with uh, criteria that would that essentially prioritize longevity of investment to where the campuses that would need full rebuilding uh, kind of took a little more priority uh, in our discussion, be just because, you know, a full rebuild would go, you know, several decades before needing uh, significant renovations. So uh, just kind of a little bit of insight to our discussion, but overall the uh, junior highs did evolve as the, uh, the campuses probably needing the most uh, priority. Thank you for stepping up for group five, Cody. Last but not not least, group six. Cool. All right, so I was voted by the one person who allowed me to do this. Um, so what we also kind of had a, a pretty good focus on the, the junior high, it was all said and done. Um, we broke down each category individually and we were pretty honest in ranking those. And then as we were doing it, once we got to the final recommendation part, we kind of, kind of were torn a little bit about how it ended up um like it kind of we wanted to we part of us maybe wanted to not have mission valley ahead of smith times different things um there was different times throughout the whole conversation too that we almost wanted to kind of like put like a two three somewhere instead of ranking them a four and a five like a three a and a three b 
um, we, but we, we kind of, then we st started figuring out kind of how we wanted to kind of see how the other groups have finished it off as well. Um, I'm glad that there were other groups as well that kind of had Smith where we did. So, I mean, it kind of, I guess, is a kind of overview of the group, seeing it that same way. Um, but again, we really felt Stroman, our number one, and then Patty Welder ended up being our number two as well. So it's just, it, it seems like it was a good theme for Stroman to be pretty high on the prior, prior priority list. Um, but overall, it it's, seems like it was a pretty good flow of everything. So. <clears throat> well, there was a lot of um, important, serious conversation happening in each of the groups. Um, I was really appreciative to hear the, the nature of the conversation and the thoughtfulness in, in each person who was a part of it. What we have done with this tool is created a, a spreadsheet uh, that it's called the master spreadsheet that takes each of these data points that each small group put together and averages those just to give an overall average. Before I go to that spreadsheet, this is Greg reiterating, this is a draft process. This is a scenario planning process. We're just in the early stages of that scenario planning. So, Dr. Bonewell. Yes. Um, I, I just want to, uh, I had a question, but I also want to say uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Corey. You are an excellent speaker and we appreciate everything that you do. Um, the community support aspect, I think it, it, it kind of threw off a little bit. Um, but I also like, I know our group and kind of like Ms. Scott said, we looked at it as that even though we know the need was in Stroman, we looked at it from a voter's point, like who comes out and votes you know, um, and I think that's that's throwing it off. While, and we saw Mission Valley, and I think that's what adjusted the numbers for Smith and versus Mission Valley. Um, you know, because for the voter support um, that'll come out and 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 do it. Well, just the, the, in the south side areas, those numbers are usually lower. So you know, that's the way we looked at it. Was that was the approach you wanted us to look at it from that from that approach? Yeah, and and our thought process as we were putting together these potential categories for a task force to consider was um, whatever plan, whatever recommendations come forward from this task force, we want them to be successful. You know, we know that there's gonna be a lot of thought and hard work put into creating those recommendations. And so if there is a potential recommendation for a rebuild of a campus or campuses, um, one of the conversations that would be natural to have is, is this something that this particular campus or these campuses, ones that our community would support rebuilding? And so that, that's why that was included as a, as a category to, to discuss today. So going to the, the master list, and this um, flips the order. Initially, the campuses were ordered by alpha. And so now it's ordered by that far right-hand column in yeah, terms I'm of sorry. task force recommendation. <laughs> I picked up on that, Megan. Um, and so, you can see from the average of the six small groups that um, with one being the highest rated in terms of greatest need and six being the lowest rated, uh, those averages result in, in this ranking of sorts. Walking into this, really didn't know how this first exercise would work out. Uh, it's what I'm taking from this is that as an overall group, Stroman has stood out to the overall group for its need. And then there's obviously some others that kind of are in a pack together there. Uh, when you look at the overall group's consideration of Patty Welder, Mission Valley, Shields, followed by Hopkins and Smith. And so this is a, a starting point in our process to have conversations around any sort of plan. Um, whether that plan uh, include rebuild uh, or repair, uh, if we're going to potentially have recommendations from the task force around rebuild of a campus or campuses, we need to have this prioritization conversation. Uh, how it stands now may ultimately be a part of a recommendation for how the task force ends, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this is a first step in the process. So I want you to, Take a moment looking at where that landed for the group. And we're, we're nearing the end of our time and I have three poll questions 
that I want to put forward to the entire task force um, and ask you to respond to. And the first one is going to be specifically related to this, this result of this exercise. These are anonymous. So your uh, name is not going to be associated with what you select here. No pressure. <clears throat> Just want your honest thoughts. So I'm launching this first poll, which is based on what you see here in the results of the exercise. Can you support this prioritization order as a baseline structure for us to build potential bond program scenarios for the task force to review? Dr. Moen? Yes. Yes, uh, sir. I, I, I'm, I'm multitasking. I, I already answered the question. Uh, um, but I want to say this, that was one, one of my concerns. And I think even the groups, the group that we were talking about, like, or how we saw Smith come at the end. And we knew it was because of the reflection of the community support on the way we were looking at it from a voter's perspective. You know, and so that's the only concern is that 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 number how it populated and dropped Smith all the way down to the bottom um when it wasn't really for us a bottom a bottom a bottom thing and so that's my only my concern right now on the computing of the of the uh of the numbers i i definitely hear what you're saying there and one of my first thoughts as i as i hear you share that is when i look specifically at each of the columns and look at the overall averages um that um, it appears that it's it's not only a perception of the large group that that community support is closer to the, the bottom end, uh, but it's also reflective in urgency of need, value, ROI, and others specific to that campus right now um, is what the, the data is, is telling me around that. And so this question of can you support this prioritization order as a baseline structure uh, for building scenarios is important because as, as we work forward from this week to next week, part of our responsibility uh, as a leadership team, as a district, is to come to you with some potential scenarios, uh, a, an approach that may include um, rebuild and repair, or other approaches. And so having this information as a, a baseline to structure some of those scenarios for you to give us feedback on, refine, improve, mm -hmm. change, this is helpful information. So I'm gonna end the polling and share the results. So for that question, can you support this prioritization order as a baseline structure for us to build potential bond program scenarios for the task force to review? We have 94% saying yes and 6% saying no. We have a second polling question that I'm going to launch now. And it's in regard to scenario planning. <clears throat> Having reviewed facility assessment data, cost estimates of identified priority repairs, cost estimates of renovation and rebuild options, and tax rate bond capacity options, our best course of action is to consider scenarios that, and so we're asking you to select what most uh, lines up with your current thought process. Do you believe we should consider scenarios that at this time do nothing, that a facility bond is not needed? Uh, do you believe we should consider scenarios that address high priority repairs only and results in a no INS tax increase? Do you believe we should address high and moderate priority repairs, but no rebuilds? Uh, resulting in some level of INS tax increase? Or do you believe that we should consider scenarios that include one or more campus rebuilds and addresses some priority items resulting 
and some level of IMS tax increase. Wow. And again, you're not making final decisions about anything right now. You're giving us a pulse check on how to scenario plan in preparation for our future meetings. We don't want to put together scenarios that don't align with what the thought process of the task force is. <clears throat> I'm going to wait just another second, make sure I've got everybody voted. Okay, I'm going to end the polling now and share the results. So at this time, we have one respondent that has um, noted their thought process is to address high priority repairs only at this time with no INS tax increase. Uh, two respondents who have expressed that we should consider addressing high and moderate priority repairs, resulting in some level of INS tax increase. And then we have 28 respondents who have expressed that we should consider scenarios that include one or more campus rebuilds and address some priority items resulting in some level of INS tax increase. And then we have a third question to ask the group. <clears throat> and this one is around tax rate impact. So you tell us task force. The task force should consider a bond plan with the following potential INS tax impact. One, no INS tax increase. Two, a, an increase between the range of one cent and six cents, which equates to a monthly tax increase of 83 cents to $5 on the high end at six cents per $100,000 in home value or property value. A, an increase in the range of seven cents to 12 cents, which equates to an increase of between $5 and 85 cents and $10 and five cents per 100,000 in property value monthly. A range of 13 to 18 or a range of 19 to 27. And take your time. I know there's a lot more variables involved in this one. This is a more detailed question. And again, you're just providing us with information that will be helpful for us to know how to bring back scenario plans for you to edit, refine, chop up like one of Greg's first essays in ninth grade, <laughs> English one pre-AP. Okay, I think we've got all of the responses in. So I'm going to end the polling and share the results. And so for this question, we had um, one task force respondent um, that the tax impact should be a no INS tax increase. We had 10 respondents that it should be a range between one and six cents. Uh, 17 respondents of a range between seven and 12 cents two respondents between 13 and 18 cents, and two respondents between 19 and 27 cents. So for probably the eighth time tonight, I'm gonna to reiterate that this is excellent information to help us as a leadership team and you as a task force to continue the work forward. Uh, we are in the most critical stage of this process. I appreciate the high level of attendance that we had tonight, and it's going to be critical that 
we have a high level of attendance and participation in our next two meetings, knowing the process and the time frames that we have to uh, come to a determination of potential task force recommendations for the process. I'm gonna stop the share on those results and just go back to presentation for our final slide, I believe. And so I do, I do want to thank you for the additional time that you gave us tonight. This was such an important conversation that uh, it, it just couldn't be cut short. Um, we are meeting again on Tuesday, December 8th, next Tuesday. The topics that we plan to address there are potential bond project scenarios. So we'll bring you uh, several different scenarios for your feedback. Um, and iteration, for those of you who have served previously on our um, zoning task force, it would be much in the same vein that we started out with a few scenarios of, hey, here's some ideas that may make sense to us as a leadership team, help us make them better, improve them, tell us what we need to consider and change. Uh, we will be making an effort to bring you some scenarios based on the feedback you've given us up to this point and to continue to refine those scenarios until we end up with that that A plus paper that we're looking for. And as we get there, we'll work around that building consensus process together. And I, I expect the, these same topics will be on our agenda for both the December 8th and the December 15th meeting. Dr. Beaumont, can I can I make a suggestion of something real quick? Absolutely. Um, just as working on the, the zoning one too and stuff, and I know that a lot of our different um, options and stuff that we were looking at kind of, and what we kind of finally came down to is a lot about how many kids is it really affecting as like on that one, it was, we didn't want to affect as many kids and stuff. Um, and so we, that kind of helped with knowing the numbers of each campus um, on how many students are going to be affected at each campus. Um, personally for me, um, when in our, in our group and everything, we start talking about how many kids are currently at these, how many at these campuses, how many is the capacity right now and all that stuff. Same conversations we were having in the zoning meetings and stuff um, to where whenever we do mention these six campuses, even again, if we can maybe throw in kind of like the, the current enrollment at each one of those to kind of see um, and it may change, it may not even change somebody's opinion about which one may need to be ranked higher than others. But just to kind of, for me, it's like, I, I want to see which campuses can we put money into that's going to help benefit more of the students as a whole. Um, and instead that may help with a little bit of the rankings and all that stuff. I'm not sure. Um, but that's just kind of the way that I'm thinking about some of these things is where can I affect more students possibly um, at, in making some of these decisions. Absolutely, that's very easy information for us to provide, Corey. Okay. Certainly. Uh, any any other thoughts and questions before we let you go? I'm sorry, I'm moving my about to die. I, I would, uh, Mr. Miller, I would like to say something on what he just said. I, I believe you sent that out a couple of weeks ago. So if you just send those sheets back out, he'll have those numbers that he that, that he was asking for. Okay, yeah, I, rem I remember we had talked about like capacities and stuff, but just kind of just when like thinking about these, like I, guess, I, don't, I don't have those sheets with me, I guess I should have printed those out or something, but um, just kind of if they're even with the numbers of the campuses, just whenever we're talking about them may help a little bit. Absolutely, we can certainly provide the enrollments um, or capacities for okay. those campuses. Well, to add, add, this is Johnny, to add to that, maybe the ages as well, because our group was asking about ages on um, if we were going to address the 1950 buildings, the 60s, leave the 1990 buildings alone. So that was a question brought up in our group, just saying. Thank you, Johnny. And we can certainly, we can put together a couple spreadsheets that we already have with that information and combine them and, and send that out to the group in advance so you have it. Greg, I'm sorry, when, uh, um, yes, when sir. they, I just had a question. I, our tax rate is currently, what did you say, zero? Uh, our current our, 
Well, we have two tax rates. The, the one that is specific to um, buildings and infrastructure, our debt service tax rate, uh, the one we refer to as INS, is currently 0.2235 cents. So it's basically like 22 cents, a little over 22 cents. And it got that way through refinancing a bond, right? So it, it got that way over time through um, approval of bonds by the community um, and has been adjusted over time. Um, it's been lowered in some years um, as debt has been paid off or as bonds have been refinanced at a lower rate or defeased. Oh, yeah, I, I was just saying because I saw a couple of them had got refinanced a few years back and it had mentioned that it had showed the difference in the tax rate and what it did to it. Oh, uh, and uh, all right, thank you so much. Sir, no, good question. Any other questions? I'm happy to stay behind uh, with the group. I know I've kept you longer than, um, than we had asked for you to join us tonight and I certainly appreciate and thank you for that. Um, but I'll stay behind with any questions and, and just wish everyone a, a, a good night and look forward to seeing you again next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Have a blessed night. You as well. Thank you, Justin.